What's up y'all, Daphne here, and welcome back to Seriously, What the Frick? It is motherfucking season three, y'all. I'm so excited for this lineup. I'm just, I'm just so excited. I wasn't able to get as much as a, of a break as I wanted. Um, I worked on this nonstop, literally. I, But I didn't get as much done. I kind of realized that it was a lot to do. Honestly, the YouTube captions, the website captions, that shit got me. Those aren't still up to date. I still got about eight episodes out in about a month and a half. That really shows how much it takes. It takes a long time to do those, which I realized. I'm still working on those day and night. We're trying to do like 29 episodes in like a month and a half on top of making merch, on top of writing episodes, also on top of just having another job and it being like the holiday season. It was a lot. But I'm sure while you're listening to this, I'm probably working on those captions. But before I get into the very set episode that is this week, I gotta talk about some stuff since it's the start of the season. Alright, so first things first. I got new fucking merch. Go check it out. I got a whole lot more designs. I got stickers. I got posters. I got, you know, fucking everything. Not everything you can think of because you can probably think of a lot of things that I don't have. It's all, it's fine. But all of my new merch and all my previous merch are all going to be in a t-shirt, a long sleeve, a sweater, and a hoodie. So go check it out. There's also like 3,000 colors with each. You know, so there's a whole bunch of colors, a whole bunch of sizes. You know, and there's a few that's strictly black or, you know, it's maybe just white and black, just depending on the design. But a lot of them have so many colors. Doing inventory was a bitch. <laughs> But go check it out. Link is in the box on the Instagram, the Facebook, literally everything. Just type in www.seriouslywiththefrook.com. You actually still have to type it in like that to get to the website just because there's still some logistics that I got to do. Um, so the link's not broken. It's just fucked up, um, <laughs> which I promised would be fixed and it's not. So another thing I wasn't able to get done. It's just because I'm stupid and I just forget about it. What do you think I put that at a type priority? But it's also like definitely out of my hands, but it really doesn't matter. I'm going to move on. Okay. Another thing I need to get out of the way, the Patreon. So this season I am starting bonus episodes for my Patreon. They're monthly. doesn't matter what tier you are. You know, my five tiers are Omega, Beta, Alpha, and God tier. So you guys go, go check those out. 5, 10, 15, and no, 5, 10, 20, 35, I think. And there will be airing the first Monday of every single month, except except for January, because I didn't want the bonus episode to be up before the actual start of the season. So it's going to be up January 10th. We're going to be talking about Lauren L. Cho. So go check that out if you're not a Patreon. If you are a Patreon, go check it out. They're monthly. I get to just talk about a lot more shit. I get to be a lot more less professional since it's just you guys, um, which who thought I can get any less professional than I already am, but it's fine. Um, you know, and also on the Patreon, you get, you know, exclusive Patreon merch. You know, stickers, posters, shirts, hoodies. You get the episodes a week ahead. You get ad-free content, which I don't have ads, but like for the future, if I ever do get ads. It's just a whole bunch of bonus content. And this episode's been up since December 20th. No, December 31st. You guys are like a week behind. What the hell, man? Get with the Patreons. Number three. I think that's it, actually. Only in, okay, just like a little fun fact about this episode. This was supposed to be the second bonus episode. This was supposed to go up in February for the Patreon, so a little tiny bonus episode. And then I realized it's not very tiny and it shouldn't be a bonus episode. Um, I think it's just because of how much of an emotional roller coaster it was for me doing this. Um, you know, and it kind of fucked up the order of the episodes just a little bit. Um, just because I try to put the dates roughly around the same time like the story let's say something happens like august 23rd depending on what that friday is i try to put it as close together as a date in the story just to you know meta i guess putting putting this case up was uh yeah didn't help so things got a little shifted around but this you know but i just thought this was too important for me to just make a bonus episode here it is on the actual podcast but it doesn't matter because it's, it's it's way too important for me to talk about instead of just me bitching about my timeline in my episodes so whatever it's fine i'm gonna stop ranting now and actually get to the case um so as i said before this shit is sad again one of my episodes literally never sad it has to do with murder all the time something sad happens if you guys don't remember in season two we had talked about gabriel fernandez 
Uh, super fucking upsetting story. I don't even really remember, but I think I got pretty upset in that one just because of how much it could have been prevented and how Gabriel could have been like in high school right now. He'd be 17 on the 20th of this month, straight up living his best life. But no, people had to be shitty. And unfortunately, he was not the only one to fall victim to the failure of DCFS. This week, we will be talking about Noah Quattro. <laughs> I forgot how sad that new intro is. I think I, I, I'll i talk about that after I talk about this. I need to stop talking about stuff. Noah Quattro was born August 20th in 2014 to his parents, Jose Maria Quattro and Ursula Elaine Juarez. And I'm also going to assume that he was born in Palmdale, California. So how his parents met, Ursula met Jose at the John F. Kennedy High School in Granadade. I don't fucking, I didn't look this one up. Granadonde Hills, and she gave birth to their first son when she was 18, Noah at 20, and then they had a daughter at 23. When Ursula was pregnant with Noah, she had a baby sister named Bobby Jean, who actually ended up suffering a skull fracture somehow. In Ursula's care, Bobby Jean was like 10 months old when this happened, so we're already throwing up red flags. So when Noah was born, him and his siblings, I know, there, okay, so there's some information like skewed up a little bit. He's reading a whole bunch of different things from different sources. Some was saying that his siblings were taken away, but then I was also reading that his sister was born to like three years later and that he only had a slightly older brother. So I am not sure. So he does have sib multiple siblings at some point, but from some sources he's only only had an older brother i don't know i just know at some point they just had a fuck ton of kids that's literally all i know but regardless when noah was born some of the kids quote unquote were whisked away by dcfs and if you don't remember what DCF, dcfs stands for it's department of children and family services and he was taken away immediately at the womb like just came out the womb and straight taken away with state of california like straight up was taken away and this is just because the agency had accused Ursula of abusing her half infant sister, Bobby Jean, just because of the school fractures that she had obtained while Ursula was in her care. No, excuse me, when Bobby Jean was in Ursula's care, yes. So Noah was cycled through a few foster homes in the first few weeks of his life before he was eventually placed in the care of his great grandmother, Eva Hernandez in San Fernando. So his parents didn't really like the fact that DCFS had taken Noah away so quickly since they felt like they were missing out in the beginning part of his life, which is a very crucial bonding time, especially with the mother. Um, and Ursula felt especially offended when Noah would call Eva mommy, which I kind of get. When Noah was roughly nine months old, DCFS could not prove that Ursula had actually abused her little sister. And so Ursula and Jose were granted, um, they're just cleared just to have Noah and their kids back um, and, you know, to like live with them again. It is reported that when Noah began to live with his parents, his health took a mighty turn in like a bad way. He missed eight doctor's appointments over the spring and summer of 2016. Ursula had blamed them for having medical like insurance problems, but a social worker said, nah, they always had medical coverage. And by the time Noah was two years old and he was only 17 pounds, it is reported that he only gained a few ounces between February of 2015 and October of 2016. It is also reported that his muscles were just deteriorating and he still wasn't able to walk. Quote, he appeared very thin, his eyes were hollow, end quote. Jennifer Montano said, and she worked on Noah's case a little bit. Ursula said that Noah ate way too much to the point where he would throw up and that's why he wasn't gaining any weight. I'm going to go ahead and call bullshit on that one. But Noah was once again removed from the, from his parents for this time for Noah's condition um, and his parents neglecting him. While in foster care and later at Bithia's house, which is just a facility in San Gabriel Valley for kids that are medically fragile, Noah gained all the weight he needed, several pounds. He actually, actually he had no longer even had di like digestive problems like that's how bad, like how thin he was to the point where he couldn't even digest things right. So Michelle Thompson, she was an administrator at Bithia's house and um, she had a lot of good things to say about Noah. 
one saying, quote, he was not quite caught up yet, but he was almost there. He was running around, sliding the slide. He would call himself no-no, end quote. He couldn't say Noah, so he said no, no. He is so cute. You guys, if you guys haven't seen the picture of it, it's going to be up on the Instagram or on the Patreon, depending on where you're listening. So cute. This little kid is so goddamn cute. I don't even know how to handle myself. Michelle said, quote, she'll remember him forever as such a ham with a wild mop of brown hair and a sweet, sweet deposition, end quote. After this, Noah did go live with his great grandmother, Eva. Um, after this, she said he was such a bright little boy. And this is when she is recalling a visit to the doctors when Noah was singing old MacDonald in the waiting room. Quote, every day he'd tell me, grandma, do you know what time it is? It's time for you to hold me and tell me you love me. End quote. This is wrecking me from the inside out. You know, but of course his stupid fucking parents wanted him back and Ursula claimed that she would never intentionally starve her child and was upset because DCFS made her miss the first nine months of Noah's life and that she, quote, just wanted to be one big family again, end quote. Stupid bitch. So the process was started. First, it was supervised visits. The court did allow this and then eventually it did progress to weekday or weekend visits. How nice. It was reported that Noah would, uh, would begin to wet the bed a few days before or after visiting his parents and he would lose his mind, screaming up to 45 minutes, crying, begging to stay with his great grandma. Quote, he would cry to me and tell me that I don't want to go with them, end quote. And that's what one of the caseworkers said when he would, or like when they would transport Noah to and from the houses. So this caseworker was named Elizabeth Aviles. Um, she actually had to demote herself in DCFS just because of how stressful this case was. And I'm pretty sure there were probably other factors that went into that. In 2018, a little bit after Noah turned four, Noah told Elizabeth that, her, that his parents' house was a, quote, sad house because they would get angry and yell, end quote. He's four. Four-year-old should not be able to label what a sad house is. It's just, this entire thing just pisses me off on so many levels. And I understand that when it comes to working with places like DCFS or, you know, with CPS, just where children are involved in shitty situations in general, it's hard. And I do think people, I do think they want to do what is best for the kids and they do want their kids to be with their parents, but sometimes people should not be parents forever and ever. People shouldn't be, a lot of people shouldn't be parents ever. Fucking make them bitches infertile. Give them a test if they want to try to be parents. If they fail, fucking do whatever they need to make sure to not procreate, adapt, or adopt, babysit, whatever. Like, just don't. Okay, maybe that's some, like, dystopian shit, but, like, some people shouldn't be parents. And that is a problem, and it's not really something you can really fix. <laughs> So, which is unfortunate, this entire thing just makes me super upset and I'm just going to move on now. Eva, Noah's grandmother, a great grandmother, sorry, um, told DCFS constantly that giving Noah back to his parents forever would be a very bad choice and quote, catastrophic. And since him being away for his parents for half his life, so two years, and the weight, that he, the weight and the height he was for his age, it just wasn't, you know, it shouldn't have happened and you know since he was already stunted at growth and you know was abused in such a way that his body physically reacted to not even doing the things it's supposed to do especially at such a young age she felt like it would have been a very bad choice quote they never bonded with noah and i think that's why they treat him the way that they do end quote and then eva told this to a caseworker and noah didn't want to leave you know she he never wanted to leave and he kept on saying, quote, this is my home. Grandma and grandpa love me, end quote. Uh, Noah said that to someone that worked at DCFS, um, but he would say that a lot, being like, hey, you know, I live here. I like these people. Fuck my parents. But like in a four-year-old way sort of thing. Here's the thing. Some people at DCFS really did not want Noah to be with his parents. Susan Johnson, who I think was the main caseworker on Noah's case for a long time, I'm not quite sure. Uh, she had told a juvenile court commissioner that it was very unsafe that Noah and that Noah had no reason to be there and that their parents had not fully complied with the visitation nor had gone to therapy as they were court ordered to do so. So the commissioner, Stephen Ipson, I believe, said, nah, that's crazy. They're getting their kid back and claimed he believed that Noah's parents, Ursula and Jose, had shown, quote, substantial growth and progress and then 
Noah was given back to one of the worst parents ever. Excuse me, Ursula and Jose. Also, Stephen, the idiot, he refused to keep my opinions and insults about private about this whole thing. Um, but he did impose therapy on Noah's parents and did give Eva visitation rights. I read that it was his parents, but also I think somewhere in the script, it was Noah that was supposed to go to therapy. So I'm not quite sure who was supposed to go to therapy, but a lot of my sources are saying that it's Noah. So scratch that. I think, they, yeah, I think Noah was supposed to go to therapy. So Noah was supposed to go to therapy and that they, he was supposed to go. And then they did give Eva the right to visit since that was his mom for a while, quote unquote. Susan's mistrust, I guess, I can say um, about Noah's parents, it got to the point where she would do unannounced visits to the Quattro House family um, just to kind of see if they were hiding any mistreatment from Noah um, since they were, according to Elizabeth, to be, quote, ha um, habitual liars, end quote. And I'm going to assume that Susan agreed. Um, since it later came out that Ursula and Jose had lied about having any sort of medical coverage for Noah and where they lived. A lot of the time, Susan wouldn't even be able to do scheduled visits because I guess Ursula and Jose hated the visits in general. So Ursula was a manager in training at a McDonald's at the time, and then Jose worked in construction on the occasion, but they would always kind of say like, oh, you know, like, sorry, I'm at the mall or I'm out of town, and they would just make up excuses to not be available so Susan couldn't report, you know, their stupid fucking shitty abuse to their own kids to the state of California. So that's cool. When Susan was able to make her visits, Noah and his siblings didn't even have their own beds, and it was very clear that Ursula and Jose completely ignored the conditions that they were given um, by a juvenile court to follow. Noah didn't even attend preschool. He was four at this time. Usually you start kindergarten at like five, and I'm pretty sure you have to do preschool first. Nor did Eva ever even saw a moment of Noah, so that's also something they're not following. Um, and there's no way that he went to therapy because that would, of course, be the only thing out of the three things he needed to be doing that would be impossible for him to be doing. Like, if they couldn't even take him to school or see his grandma, what in the fuck would make y'all think he's going to go to therapy? What? So in March of 2019, Susan goes for another check on Noah, just like, you know, just the overall family. And when she gets to the apartment, Jose's sister opens the door and Susan's confused. Like, what the fuck is this? and said that Jose and his family, I guess you can call it that, hasn't lived there in at least four months and that the family has occasionally lived in that, um, like in that apartment. And his mom, Jose's mom, had even confessed to being worried about her grandchildren. According to Jose's mom, her name was Nuvia. Nuvia? I don't know, I didn't look that one up. She reported that Noah was always hungry and that she was super worried that none of her grandkids were in school. Um, about a month after this, Susan tries to go to the apartment and finds Jose's family, but not like Ursula and Noah and all the other kids. Maggie Hernandez, she was one of Noah's aunts, made a call anonymously to a child abuse hotline and reported that his butt hurt and that Ursula wasn't feeding him and quote, if he's vocalizing that something's wrong, he's having night terrors. I feel like something is going on, end quote. So Susan says, oh, hell no and rushes to go see Noah. She sees marks on his right arm and his neck and on his left arm was a big bruise. And then he had like lotion like that was just applied on his back. And Ursula claimed that the cream was for eczema, but Susan was pretty suspicious that she couldn't even really see the skin under the lotion. When Noah was alone, Susan asked what happened when he did something wrong, which, you know, kids make mistakes. That's like the whole point of growing up. You make mistakes, you learn from that, that's fine. But Noah said, quote, I get hit. When Noah said that, he seemed shocked at that was his response. Like he looked like he said something he wasn't supposed to say or that it was weird that he said it out loud or something like that. So Susan went to go ask a little bit more about it. Like, what do you mean? Like, how do you get hit? Like, just ask him for a little bit more details. And he immediately blurted, I do not get hit. Like he was backtracking and taking back the previous claim. So this kind of made Susan think that his parents were like, what do you say if someone asks you get hit? You say, I do not get hit. You know, as his parents gone over it, like it was kind of like coach, like when, like for parents out there, when you ask your kids, what do you do if a stranger asks if they want candy? You say no and you run. Well, a good, a good parents would coach them on that. But this one claimed on coaching on not 
telling people that they get hit, so. So on May 9th, Susan had told the juvenile court that, quote, many concerns have arisen from the family, end quote, and that the parents were making it nearly impossible, quote unquote, to see Noah, how he was doing, um, and that they were making a legit effort to be seen, to not be seen by caseworkers so they can hide their shitty fucking parenting. I wouldn't even call it parenting, to be honest. They're not parents. They're the kind of people that are just housing children, for some reason, have some rights to these kids, but they don't actually treat like humans, especially Noah. It makes no sense. But if you guys really look at child abuse stories or even like when kids fucking die at the hand of their own parents, it's always the one kid that gets it worse. They're never equal with the abuse, which is, it's it's a very sharp double-edged sword. Like, it's just because like, yeah, like not all three kids are being, expe- uh, you know, abused to a specific extent. But like that one kid who gets it worse, it's fucking awful. Like there's no bright side. It's a shitty life and it's a legit problem that I feel like we're all aware of, but don't seem to quite understand the full extent of it until it's too late. I don't know, JC's cases really get to me. It's one of the many, many, many reasons I don't want to have kids. Not that I'm afraid, like I'm not going to be like a bad parent. Like I'm, I don't, I won't do anything hor- or horrible to my kid. I don't know. That's, that's could have been what like Ursula and Jose said. Now look at them. That's not at all. I don't know why I'm sharing this with you. I'm not going to hit my future kids, I'm gonna just move on from that. We're gonna forget about that. Anyway, so of course, you know, Ursula and Jose still didn't take Noah to therapy. They took their time responding to Noah's medical needs and Noah seemed like whenever he did have a visit, he was coached. There had to be some like bruising on his back where the cream was. From what I'm gathering, it was an eczema because why would it be? I was to cover up bruising and Ursula had texted a picture without the cream to Susan and she saw the bruises and Ursula just said the bruises were from Noah falling off his bunk bed and hitting himself in the wood. So Susan asked Shannon O'Brien, who was a senior administrator at the Lancaster office, which is just a DCFS office in Lancaster, California. And they were talking and they were going over everything, you know, with the bruises being sketchy, the fact that Noah wasn't even in school nor has gone to therapy. Susan was like, is it time to take him away for the third time? And the only thing Shanann says was, quote, get a warrant. Maggie Vasquez Ducos was kind of the person that had to figure out if the abuse claims were credible or not, specifically the ones from Maggie Hernandez, Noah's aunt. So Susan was like the main caseworker and then Maggie Ducos was like a temporary caseworker on Noah's case. So Maggie, I'm gonna have to figure out how to talk about these two at the same time without getting them confused. Luckily, Noah's aunt Maggie doesn't really come in, I think at all after this, so nothing to worry about. But if she does come up, I really can't remember. Um, I'm gonna call her aunt Maggie, and then I'm just gonna mention the caseworker as just Maggie because I talk about her a little bit more. Um, But you know what I mean? Because I'm not gonna just keep on saying Noah's aunt Maggie. Okay, so Maggie, the the caseworker, drove over to Noah's house, the correct one this time. Um, And for some reason, Ursula just felt the need to unload all of her opinions and lies to Maggie, and especially about Susan. She didn't like Susan. And Ursula said, quote, Why would we hurt our baby when we just got him back? I've had this case open for four years now, and I've been told I'm good enough to only have two of my kids, but not Noah. How does that make any sense? End quote. But she's right, just take away all of her kids. She doesn't deserve any of them. Um, And Maggie wrote down in her case notes about how Ursula had tears rolling down her face as she said, quote, I do not trust the department, end quote. So the bruises on Noah's back, Ursula did say it was from him falling off the bunk and a medical examiner did find it plausible but that 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 could have been what the bruising was from was from him falling off the bunk and hitting on the wood, which I mean, I've done that. I've woken up to my little brother falling from the bottom bunk in his sleep and he got a nasty bruise on his forehead when we were little. So it's totally something that happens. Um, Maggie says that she attempted to reach out to Noah's grandfather, but no cigar, it wasn't very successful. Um, and, but there was also nothing that says or proves that she reached out to any of Noah's relatives. So, I don't know. So, Susan is working with LA County lawyers to get a, you know, to to file a petition to get Noah removed again, which I'm pretty sure that is the warrant she was told to get. Um, and Stephen Ibsen, the juvenile court commissioner that I called an asshole earlier for saying eh, and then giving Noah back to asshole one and two, I mean his parents. Well, he did grant that order for Noah being taken away from Ursula and Jose and to have him undergo a medical exam or a sexual abuse exam. And for some reason, none of that happened. Because why? Couldn't tell you. 
So the people at the Lancaster DCFS office began to question whether it was a good idea to pull Noah from the house again. And they were just thinking that there wasn't enough evidence or everyone thought it just wasn't necessary. It wasn't a necessary measure to be taken, which is bullshit, but all right. Even Maggie said or believed that there wasn't enough evidence to remove Noah from his home. And she also said that Ursula and Jose felt disrespected and even misunderstood by DCFS and that Noah's parents felt that Susan was harassing them. Eventually, DCFS sides with Maggie and, you know, everyone else. And then they wanted to stop the removal order of Noah and they wanted to replace Susan, who is black. I promise that makes sense right now. And they wanted to replace her with someone who spoke Spanish. Here's the thing. Noah, his parents, siblings, pretty much his the entire family were Latino, but they all spoke pretty good English. Um, it wasn't broken. It wasn't like iffy, like they spoke fucking English is fine. It's reported that only one person spoke Spanish and had limited English in his entire extended family. So what was the fucking point of removing Susan, who is now being told to go fuck herself for thinking of boys in harm's way, needs to be removed from his house, and everyone's like, nah, you're good, he's okay, when he's clearly not okay. Susan was told to withdraw the petition to remove Noah, but the court had already signed it and she was still told to not carry out that petition. So Maggie goes to the new apartment in Palmdale and Elizabeth, remember her, she was the caseworker that previously worked on Noah's case. She goes with Maggie to the Palmdale apartment and they see that Noah has something on his upper cheek, an injury or something. And there was like three different explanations to the caseworkers of what happened. So Ursula said that it was a leftover mark from kids rubbing salt and ice on him at a birthday party. Aw, even kids were doing that back then. Remember that salt and ice challenge? We were stupid. Anyway, then Noah said that it was a bug bite and then Jose said, hey, remember you fell like we took you to the doctor and they gave you ointment? At quote unquote. At some point, randomly, <laughs> Noah just ran up to Elizabeth saying, Quote, they feed me a lot, they take good care of me, and they love me, end quote. No one said anything that would result in Noah saying these things. So the caseworkers were like, what the fuck? All right, cool, they love you. Um, So there was just a whole bunch of just shit happening right now. Like, they were like, what the fuck? Quote, many of the child's responses throughout the visit appeared coached, end quote. I believe Maggie wrote that in her, like, case notes. But eventually, um, out of all the different reasons for Noah getting whatever injury he had on his cheek and them just thinking that the family lied because of their history with DCFS, which I feel like their history with DCFS should have at least made them come up with one story to make it seem like they weren't abusing their kid. I mean, they were, but like, y'all know what I mean. So, fun fact. Usually social workers have about 10 days to remove a kid from their house or wherever they are after a commissioner signs and issues a removal order. And if they don't do that, the social workers have to th tell the court like, hey, it's been 10 days, the kid's still there, just, just an FYI. It's now been 29 days and no one said anything to anyone about Noah still being in the house. So in various amounts of emails across every single chain of command you can even think of in DCFS, we're all like, what the fuck? Why is he not removed yet? Also, why did no one say anything? Quote, We do need to have a staffing on how this needs to be explained that the warrant was approved but not served. I want us to be able to submit a reply to court with a substantial reason why, and I'm not with a full understanding as to why. End quote. And Desiree um, Robinson Moody was a supervising social worker, and then she wrote this in an email because everyone's like, what the fuck? So no one's doing the job at this point, and... Fucking what the shit, all right. So on July 5th, 2019, a neighbor of Noah's family in the apartment in Palmdale walked by the family pole and they heard some kid yelling, quote, no daddy, no mommy, end quote. I'm not sure what they did, but I guess they were like, all right, and kept walking. Just after 6 p.m., Ursula and Jose called 911 in a panic, saying, quote, help, please, somebody, end quote. Jose said that to um, said that Noah was swimming and then just stopped breathing. So the police and EMTs are like, all right, something's fishy here, saying thing um, quote saying things that just were not adding up to what the father had already told us. The child is down in a pool for over thirty minutes, and all of a sudden he's now dry with a pair of tan shorts on that were not wet. End quote. There were also signs of strangulation. Also, Ursula was like in a lot of disbelief. Like, I mean, yeah, you're 
kids in trouble. So I kind of get that. And then Jose just kept on apologizing, saying, quote, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, end quote. In the ER, the emergency room, Detective Susan Velasquez found the kid with bruises across his chest, arms, and legs, and with some sort of large mark on his forehead. Quote, you knew in your heart that there was something more that he couldn't tell us, that his body was telling us a story, and we need to figure out what is going on, end quote. And that's what Velasquez says. Doctors and nurses rushed, and they did what they could to revive Noah, and he died with none of his family members by his bedside. Dr. Carol Berkowitz, who or is or was, I don't know what she's doing now, probably still being a pediatrician, is a UCLA pediatrician who ever saw Noah and all of that after he died said, quote, so many injuries, end quote. But they eventually concluded that he died of suffocation. Carol, Dr. Berkowitz, um, found rib fractures on Noah, but they had been Like, they had occurred in the last two weeks or even longer before he died. So it wasn't something that happened on the day of his death. Like, they were being healed from whatever happened to his bones, ribs, lol. Quote, it takes a significant force to fracture them, especially to fracture so many ribs and to fracture them on both sides, end quote. That's what Dr. Carroll said. Also, experts found some sort of trauma to Noah's butt, rectum. That's the appropriate word I'm looking for. Um, But they didn't quite know what the fuck did that. I think I know, but I'm not going to put that out there yet because that is a very bold claim. July 1st, um, Eva, Noah's great-grandmother, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against LA County on the behalf of herself and Noah's siblings. A wrongful death lawsuit is a lawsuit, obviously, when someone dies as a result of the defendant's negligence and or it is an intentional act. And it's pretty much when someone else close to the party that has died is against the party who they believed is liable for that death, which is one way to grieve. Um, But she said that Noah's death occurred after multiple reports of abuse, which were already made to DCFS and were saying, quote, instead of protecting Noah and his siblings, DCFS continued to place the children with their abusive parents, where the children continued to be abused over the course of several years, end quote. DCFS social workers made threats against Eva, quote, in an attempt to silence her, end quote. That's what the multiple pages of the lawsuit states, and those threats were made after Noah's death. These threats um, were that if she made any public statements about Noah's case and or lawsuits that may or may not be potential, they threatened that she would lose her request for guardianship of her other grandchildren and that she would never see them again. What the fuck? I couldn't find anything um, about or what made the police like actually arrest Ursula and Jose, but there was clear evidence that there was abuse. No one really can, like really can deny that, but I'm not quite sure what happened between Noah's death and like the hearings. Um, So I know an investigation was conducted after the autopsy because there were too many injuries that were questionable to leave alone. So I'm going to assume that that is what got Ursula and Jose arrested and their charges. I'm also going to get this right out of the gate. Um, Asshole 1 and 2, sorry, Ursula and Jose, pled not guilty. Why? Because they're awful people that don't know how to take responsibility. But anyway, they pled not guilty. Um, I'm not sure what order in things, like, I don't know what happened um, in the few of the hearings or what I can find. So I'm going to put in what I think is important, uh, really, like, really adds to the story and to hopefully answer some questions that we all have. So first, we're going to start off with the whole reason why. It's not a legit reason to do this to anyone ever, but this was Noah's parents' reasoning specifically for Jose. So there was some sort of speculation from the prosecutors that maybe Jose didn't think Noah wasn't his biologically, and that is what made Noah, out of all three kids, more of a target. A DNA test ended up confirming that he was indeed Jose's, and, you know, eventually Jose completely denied sexual abusing his son and falsely claiming that he almost drowned in the pool. At one point, Ursula said that she sent a text to Jose saying, quote, almost killed him so many times, I had to do CPR for him to wake up and to stay alive, end quote. She did this in 2017, and then she sent another text to Jose stated that he, quote, almost killed his son and beat him, end quote. After Noah's death, a whole bunch of text messages were uncovered, since FYI, just because you send one text to one person doesn't mean you're the only person who sees it. Your phone company got records of y'all's nasty shit, even Snapchat. 
That shit actually don't go away after 10 seconds. But I'm sure a majority of you guys already know that. Um, but there were some texts that were sent um, before Noah's death from a different family member saying, quote, at the end of the day, I know what's going on isn't right. And deep down inside their truth, there is there there is mistreatment to Noah, end quote. And that was Jose's sister's boyfriend or something like that. Jose's sister had a theory that Jose had something against Noah because he, quote, wouldn't be so aggressive. Another text said, quote, when he kills that kid, don't come crying to me because we told you so, end quote. His sister said also at some point, not quite sure to who, but, you know, this is all these texts are shown at the trial um, or at the hearing. Eventually, it is revealed that the reason for beating um, Noah at the pool that day was because he peed his pants and Jose got so mad he beat and choked him to death. That's my speculation. There's actually, like, there's strangulation, so that had to be something. So Noah was choked at some point. The charges that Jose is going against is account of assault on a child, causing death, and sexual penetration with a child under 10 years old. And then Ursula is facing one account of child abuse under circumstances likely to cause death. Um, I'm not sure if there's ever been a trial. I'm seeing December 8th, a pre-trial in 2020, but I can't find any sentences or anything of that nature, so I don't know if I'm stupid and I can't manage to find shit or what. Um, it also could just because this wasn't very widely publicized. Like, I only found very few articles that actually stated more than just like, oh, their hearing or like their trial was set to like September 24th and then it got moved. Like, a lot of the time, like, you know, but you think they would have at least mentioned some sort of trial of something, you know, but like, all I can find is the December 8th, 2020. Um, like pre-trial date so i don't know if covid had something to do with that um but with my sources in december of 2021 so a year later i can't find shit all i know is that jose could be facing up to 47 years to life when if you know in prison if he's convicted and has a four million dollar bail and ursula can face up to 32 years in life and her bill is set at three million so that's honestly literally all i can find about the trial um i kind of put what i felt like was going to be important at the trial or like that was, you know, put into the hearings. I just, I do not know. I could not tell you because to my knowledge, there's been no trial at all since. So I think they're still in jail kind of hanging out right now. I don't know. And that is all I have for you guys this week. If you or someone you know is experiencing child abuse or any abuse at all, call the National Hotline for Child Abuse at 1-800-422-4453. That is 1-800-422-4453. And it, that's going to be in all of the um, captions and all of that. So that's going to be out there. It's going to be in the description box. It's going to be in my show notes. It's going to be in every post that I make. And you can also just look it up too at the hotline impact reports. It is crucial that you call someone if you do know what's going on. Child abuse is so common, you know, it, it, to the point where many people who grew up in child, like in abusive homes, they didn't even realize that it was child abuse until afterwards. And they're all grown up and they're all sorts of fucked up from it. If a kid is saying something is happening to them, believe them kids do not understand that when someone that when they're being attacked and someone's telling them it's okay they don't understand what's going on they don't make that shit up kids make shit up i understand that but they do not make that shit up it's too dark for them to even really understand what's happening if someone is telling you something is going on believe them and even if for some reason they're making up that's on them they're fucked up people, but go give them the help that they need. You can save a life from ending or making it way more traumatic than it already has been. Okay, so that was a little anticlimactic. Um, I do my research when I write my script, so technically you guys go on the ride with me while I learn about some of the shit I share with y'all. Also, sorry for uh, starting the season with a very, very sad story. It wasn't planned. 
but I felt like it was way too goddamn important to not talk about on a bigger platform than just my Patreons. But y'all, there is a wild ass story and it's why I said promise. It is. I'm working on it right now. It's crazy, dude. Speaking of the Patreon, go check that out. Y'all, hella shit, it's over there. Thank you for those who are already being on there and being there. I really appreciate it. Also, the first bonus episode is coming out Monday, the 10th of January on Patreon. We will be talking about Lauren L. Cho, which is a recent disappearance and I go off the rails a little bit, but it's on a tangent I get very passionate about. It's a good tangent. I get into it a lot. I get, I get really into it. Check out the website. There's new merch. There's a few episode of captions on there. There's also YouTube captions some of them, the YouTube captions are getting up to date. Um, trust me, I'm working day and night. By the time you're working on this, I'm probably working on those captions. I really, really need to uh, get caught up on those. Let me know what y'all think on the Instagram, all of the normal shit you guys hear me talk about. And that's honestly really it. I'm super excited for this season. I'm so glad y'all are excited with me. Let me know about what y'all think about the music. kind of like the music from last season, the intro, the outro, background, all of that. I'm going to fuck with the current one for now kind of see how I feel about it and if I don't really get into it I'll probably just change it back because I really like that setup um I don't know whatever be kind make decent decisions and I'll see you guys next week at the brand new episode that will make you say seriously what the frick bye y'all